Morning, brethren. I'm going to be preaching from Acts chapter 2 concerning the determinate counsel of God. When the apostle Peter preached the gospel uh, here, he started out uh, with some of these words from Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 22. He said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him, that one, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, that wasn't the end of the message, whom God hath raised up. So that, 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 and then we're going to go on from there. Um, but when we're talking about the gospel and, and our efforts to clarify the nature and the content of the gospel, um, the gospel is an announcement of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in, by, and through Jesus, the Son of God. It does not... It doesn't necessarily accomplish that work. It actually makes that work known. So the accomplishing of it, it's making known what has been accomplished by God through Christ. And it brings that work of salvation within the reach of man through a message and through their apprehension of it and faith in it. And so through it, that is through the gospel, the Lord is actually bringing life and immortality to light. That is real life, abundant life, everlasting life eternal life, that life. He's bringing that life within the grasp. He's bringing it to light. He's bringing it, he's making it manifest so it can be both accessible and understood and obtainable through his son. This is, well, this is good news that anyone who is convicted of their sin and their, and their, and the fact that they had fallen short of the glory of God to know that life and immortality are now made known, that they're, that they're accessible, that they're obtainable, that you can actually have this. He's bringing it to light by the gospel. So the preaching of the gospel makes this work of salvation known. And not, not only the work that Christ is working, but as we're going to discuss uh, this, week, uh, this week, is the work of God in Christ. Amen. <clears throat> And so my gospel for you is that all that is accomplished and performed in salvation is according to a divine edict, not a divine reaction. None of God's working out of his eternal purpose is dependent on man or in reaction to what man has done or earned or obtained. It's really what God is doing. He's working out his purpose. In fact, the text that I'm using is uh, speaking specifically about the crucifixion of the Lord. And so... And it was, it was, they took him and slain, but see, it was, it was according to the determinate counsel of God that this all took place. <clears throat> so it's all driven by his determinate counsel and foreknowledge. So when all of creation is gathered before the Father and before the Lamb in the world to come, and when they observe the greatness of salvation, the vastness, and even the detail of redemption, if ever the question is raised, why are we here? How did we get here among the creation? Who is responsible for this everlasting life that we now possess? The answer will be a resounding and unified response. Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. They will say, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So what I'm saying here is that this is all according to the determinate counsel, and therefore it's, it's, it's not of us. The things that we even participate in and do, they're not of us. It's according to the determinate counsel of God. So men of faith have always had this perspective. I encourage you to, to grow in this perspective. Uh, but it, was, it will be most notable then, when we look back on everything that's been accomplished. Even in consideration of the Lord of glory being slain by the hands of godless men, we can see that it was not their work primarily, but that the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for to do whatsoever God's hand and God's counsel determined before to be done. They, they, see, they thought they were working something out. They thought they were doing their purpose. But it was only because they were actually accomplishing the Lord's purpose. 
And so whether it be the death, the burial, the resurrection, the exaltation, the coronation, the glorification of Christ, whatever, that, whatever it may be, even the resulting salvation of man, it's all the work um, of God. It's, it's God's work that he is doing this. And this is proclaimed through the gospel to be his work. So when we preach the gospel, we're announcing this is God's doing. We're not announcing what men ought to do. We're announcing what God has done. And what men ought to do and what men actually do is, is actually them working out and entering into this purpose and this determinate counsel of God. His predetermined plan. His eternal purpose. <clears throat> Salvation is of the Lord. Remember Jonah's words, But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that is vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And so even before this, in verse 21, this is the, the um, quoting of the prophet Joel and, and Peter explaining what was going on in their presence. Uh, it ends with these words in verse 21. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God saves men in, through, and by Christ, calling upon the name of the Lord. This is, this, is, this is what our proclamation is. Whosoever calls upon his name. See, all of salvation is a calling upon another that can save you. It's, it's not calling upon what should I do, more or less. It's, it's, it's calling upon help me. It's, it's a help. I need help. Who will deliver me? Right? Calling upon the name of the Lord. When men are aware of their sin, they will call upon someone to save them from it. They can't do it themselves. Jesus is the appointed Savior of all men. Amen. From their enlightenment... From their hearing, from their uh, uh, understanding of the gospel, from their deliverance from sin, from their even sustenance through this wilderness setting, uh, from, to their empowerment, to their overcoming, and to their eventual glorification, God is saving them to the uttermost, those who come unto him by Christ. So the issue is not about what men have done or what men are required to do. The issue is what God has done what God is doing and what God will do in Christ. Men must simply be found in him and abide in him. Like the exhortation to us, brethren, is abide in him, remain in him, remain in the love of God. And the determinate counsel of God is declared in the gospel that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. His wisdom, that which is from above, has made known to us that the only way men would be saved is by God. The Savior. He is a, he's, de, he's described as God, the Savior. That's what he does. For with men, it is impossible, but not with God. Amen. And so we can look at all the things that are involved with God's work. You can even trace this back to your own salvation. Find yourself in the scriptures, which I encourage you to do. But when the hearing ear and the seeing eye, they're both of the Lord, right? So the, the hearing of the gospel. So, somebody, somebody was sent to you to preach the gospel. Um, God himself was teaching you, that's why you came to Jesus. God was drawing you, that's why you came to Jesus. It wasn't just you made up your mind to go. No man comes to, uh, to me unless the Father who draws him. That's what happened. And so you can look back and see, why did I come to Jesus? I was being drawn by the Lord. And so you see how the, the appropriate perspective is to see that the, this is the Lord's doing. It is God who uh, pierces the heart, convic convicts men of sin, righteousness, and judgment through the Spirit. Uh, God opens the heart that they may attend to the gospel. Uh, God causes the light to shine into their heart. God has given all things into Christ's hand. All things, you can find yourself in there as well. He's given all things into Christ's hand. Uh, God gives men to Christ. Now this is a good, this is, well, this is, this is the way I would do it, I think. This is, I like it like that. that God, in order for you to be saved, God is going to give you to his son and then command his son, the one who always does the will of the Father, bring him to me. That's how salvation is being worked out. I'm going to give you to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Christ is successfully bringing many sons to glory. In fact, when he gives you to the son, the son gives you eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Right? And so he gives you eternal life. He brings many sons to glory. He's bringing us to God. He is the faithful servant who is doing well. Well done, good and faithful servant. All things are being delivered to the Father by the Son, and his people also are being delivered unto him without spot or without wrinkle or any such thing, and with exceeding joy. This is, a, this is a good work of salvation. It's thorough through and through. If you abide in the Son, you will be saved. We are kept by God, by the power of God, through faith, and, kept, and, and your life is hid with Christ in God. 
This is the working of God, and it's being worked through Christ. And, and the Holy Spirit's involved in this, and the angels are involved in this, and your precious brethren are involved in this as well. But it's God who's doing this work. God's the Savior. Amen. This is all according to the determinate counsel of God. Now, that's just something to think about, that God has determined. And when God determines something, it's going to come to pass. And God is determined to save men. He's determined to, be, uh, uh, to bless them, to be benevolent toward them. Now, who among us would stand up and say, yeah, I, I deserve that, right? So, so in order for this to be just, he had to, he had to open up a way to bless men, and that's where Christ comes in. Amen. Jesus, now here's what he says here. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. If that was never said, none of the rest of it could be said. But Jesus is a man approved of God. He was always the chosen one of God. Amen. He was always approved of God. His miracles, wonders, and signs were actually a manifestation or an attestation of the fact that he was approved by God. It wasn't because he did these things that he was approved. They were actually making known who he actually was. They testified of who he was. They were a demonstration that God was actually in him working salvation in the midst of the earth and in the heart of man. He was chosen of God. So while it is true that Jesus fulfills the type of the high priest bring one chosen uh, from among the people, right? So th while that is true, he was, he's actually the one chosen of God. And it wasn't as though God was looking across humanity and saying, I need one, oh, there's one, Jesus, he hasn't sinned, so I'm going to choose him. That's not how it was. In fact, in order to have this man, God sent the man, right? And so he was always, he was chosen ahead of time. It wasn't, it wasn't just a selection of one of the best one. It wasn't that at all. He had to send him. So he does, he does fulfill that, that, that type of the one chosen from among the people, uh, but it's also true that this choice was not a response by God, but more so a work of God. <clears throat> God wasn't just looking at humanity and happened across a sinless man to select. Rather, God sent the man. Rather, God, God was with this man. In fact, God, God was this man. Amen. God's approval of Christ was based first upon who Christ is, and not what he did. It was in view of what he would accomplish, but it was because of who he is, who, who he was. The person must be approved before what they do is approved. And so we can learn this. Um, so the approval of the works is actually a product of the approval of the person. If the person is not approved, it doesn't matter what they offer to God. If they're not accepted by him, what they offer is not going to be accepted either. In fact, the works of the earthly priest brought... No pleasure. Not, I mean, they were according to the command of God. He commanded them, they brought them, and, and I took no pleasure in them. Why? Because you're not acceptable. You're not acceptable. But see, I have, but see, there's another high priest. There's the true high priest. He's acceptable. What he offers is acceptable. And, and, so, and so now, remember in, in, in Malachi, I prophesied about the Levites and their offerings would now be acceptable. Now what you do is acceptable. Why? Because you have been accepted in the beloved. Amen. And so Jesus is a man approved by God, and because of that, we in Christ can be approved of God. What a, what a, you can be approved of God. <clears throat> Christ was without spot, without sin, and with no guile in his mouth. And for this, his sacrifice was approved, and his works bear witness the fact that he was accepted. And so you can rest assured tonight that your soul is safe in the hands of Jesus because Jesus is a man approved of God. Salvation is sure because God has approved of the foundation stone upon which salvation is built. The, 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 the foundation, I lay in Zion, a choice stone, that stone is precious. And if you're built upon that stone as living stones, you'll be accepted because of the acceptance of the salvation stone. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. A man approved of God. And so really what we have in the coming of Christ is the revelation of the Savior. Um, Jesus wasn't chosen on account of the work that he accomplished. He was chosen in view of the work that he would accomplish. Uh, and so he was chosen before the foundations of the world were laid. His works were actually a revelation of his election. They testified of who he was. And so when, when Peter preaches here, he says, these miracles and wonders and signs, which he did, which you yourselves also know, him, that one. And so they, see, see, God was testifying through these works of who his son was. And he said, and that one, you yourselves know that he did these things. And you, therefore, you know who he was. That one you took. The one, the Lord, the very one that all of creation had been waiting for, him. 
He was approved of God in their midst, and they took him and killed him at the hands of wicked men. And in fact, it says that he being delivered by the determinate counsel of God. How could this be? Well, he was delivered over by the determinate counsel of God. This, Jesus was really being delivered into their hands by God himself. Here he is. God was bringing his lamb to the slaughterhouse. He, he, there was men who would do the work, and he brought his lamb. Here's the lamb of God. God was delivering his just one into the hands of unjust men and for unjust men that they might be justified by faith and God might be justified in passing over those sins. Jesus, what was Jesus doing in all this? He was obeying the commandment given by his father to lay down his life and to take it up again. God was, what was God, God was laying in Zion, a precious cornerstone, a foundation stone upon which his kingdom would be built. Uh, Jesus was, was actually, how about this? Jesus was walking into the good work that was laid before him. It was, he was, it was a work prepared for him and Jesus was walking into it. Jesus was for fulfilling all the types and all the shadows and all the prophecies concerning the servant of Jehovah. That's what he was doing. So him being delivered by the determinate council. See, God has always purposed to do this, and all of what you have prior to that is actually a la it's preparing the way for the Lord. He's preparing, so when I give my, my lamb, you're going to be fully aware of what a lamb is all about. You're going to know what a sacrifice is all about. You're going to know the, the price of, 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 of sin. You're, you're going to know what mercy is all about. You're going to know how precious mercy is and how much you need it, and I'm going to send my son, I'm going to send the lamb. And so this was the, him being delivered by the determinate council. See, that's what the gospel announces, that God has always purposed to do this. This wasn't a, what happened in a surprise, and this was always according to God's working. Amen. And God's working didn't stop with that. There, there's the, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow. Amen. God's determinate counsel. It's determinate. I really like the way that's worded there. No other counsel I could think of is determinate. Uh, no other purpose or plan actually determines the outcome or the work accomplished. The counsels and the plans of men, I can testify concerning my flight uh, last night, that the counsels and plans of men are really just suggestions and hopeful wishes. They, they may not come to pass the way you plan on having them come to pass. Well, see, God's not like this. If God determines to do something, it will come to pass. But see, and, and even here, now if man makes a plan and it falls in line with what God has purposed to do, well, now you've got something that can work here. But the counsels of men will determine to do things and even purpose in their hearts, but it is still questionable as to, as to whether the thing will be done. But the purposes of the kingdom of God are all engraven on stone. If he's determined to do it, he will do it. It doesn't matter who rises up against him, he will accomplish it. In fact, someone can rise up and try to cause harm to him, and he'll use them to fulfill his purpose. He'll actually use their wicked desires and the hands of wicked men to accomplish his very thing. He'll, you know, Satan just wants to devour the, the child that comes out of the woman, right? He just, he just wanted to devour him, and so he actually used him and destroyed him in it. He, you're, you want to kill him? You'll kill him, and then you'll be destroyed. By death, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. <clears throat> and so this is really the basis for all sound reasoning and all, and all faith that we have in God, that God has a determinate counsel. This is the basis for our faith. God's counsel is what is able, it's, in fact, his counsel, his, his plans, his purposes are actually able to counsel us. It's able to help us to think rightly, to, to have sound reasoning concerning our own experience and, and concerning what should come to pass in our lives and in the kingdom of God. Because God has determined a thing, we understand what he has determined and we're able to think the correct way about our own circumstances and concerning our own, our own existence and our own, our own salvation. We can think rightly because God has made known to us a determinate counsel of his own. <clears throat> his will, his purpose, his preferences is what justifies any approved plans by men. If our desires fall in line with his determinate counsel, it too will come to pass. Here's what John said about this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. That's when, like, your, your purposes, your desires, your, your asking falls in line with what God has purposed to do. You have them. And so this is the foundation of faith. Knowing his eternal purpose, his will, his plan, this is why there, there's really no... Um, 
suitable substitute for the gospel of Christ. When you preach the gospel, you're making known the determinate counsel of God, what God is determined to do. And so this is the basis for faith. And so knowing his purpose, knowing what he is working out, knowing what Christ is doing now, knowing what God is doing in Christ, this is actually the basis for our faith. And so because of all this, his counsel will actually enable you to think right and therefore act right. Act, that is, righteously. And in accord with God's purpose and God's very person. Because his purpose, his determinate counsel is always in accord with his own person. The righteous, therefore, are as bold as lions because they're approved of God. But if any man shrink back, the Lord will have no pleasure in him. See, ignorance of God's purpose will leave men guessing. I think this is good. I think I ought to do this. It'll leave men stabbing in the dark, and it'll actually leave them unable to live by faith. People who are ignorant of God's purpose can't live by faith because they, they just don't know. It's just wishful thinking and guesswork. This is what we, we preach just to make this thing known, that you can be sure of the way that you're walking. You can walk circumspectly. You can walk in such a way that you know is pleasing unto the Lord. But you can't live by faith while being ignorant of God. <clears throat> I just thought this was interesting, and I'll, uh, I know we, uh, we got a lot of speakers here, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear uh, Brother Bob as well. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up with one final thought about, actually I'm going to talk about the will of man. Because, because he says here that him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, there was a divine, like, overrule when he's, but whom God raised up, right? But so here, here's, what, here's what was going on is that men actually had a plan to take him. They had a desire. They had a purpose. They had a will. Man had a will to take him. Now, they thought that this was free, that they were able to do this of their own volition, but really it was because they were working out God's purpose. That's the only way and the only reason that they were able to do this because you know they had a purpose beforehand to do this as well, and Jesus just walked right through them. Well, what was that? They had a purpose. How come they weren't able to do it then? Well, because it didn't fall in line with God's timing. It didn't fall in line with the fullness of time. It didn't fall in line with God's purpose. And so they thought that they were working out their free will. They actually weren't. They were actually working out his divine and determinate counsel. That's what was going on here. Uh, but so man's will was not overruled. It wasn't even outlawed. It was used against them is what happened here for God to accomplish his will. You see, this is why men say we have free will, because they think that they can, they're getting away with things, but actually they're wor wor working in accord with what God is allowing them to do. All of man's wills is actually subservient to God's rule, God's kingdom, God's reign, God's purpose, God's determinate counsel. Amen. <clears throat> they think they can do what they want and get what they really want, but really they're only allowed to do what will accomplish God's will. All of man's plans are subservient to God's purpose whether they know it or not now here's where you can fall in line with this if men seek to do wickedness and they are they are allowed to accomplish it whether it be persecution of the church whether it be whether it be putting to death the lord of glory if they're allowed to do this they'll actually accomplish their purpose it'll fall in line with god is actually working out his eternal purpose but they're going to be condemned for it this is similar to like what Nebuchadnezzar was used for. I'll raise up my servant Nebuchadnezzar and he will, he, well, he'll put you in slavery. That's what he's going to do. That's what his desire is. We'll allow him to do it because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you for not keeping the Sabbath. Right? But then, but then as soon as he's accomplished his purpose, he's done and I'm throwing him down. And then somebody else is going to come up. But see, here's the thing. Where we fall into this, if our purposes fall in line with God's purpose... And it's benevolent to the people of God. It's for the good of the people of God. It's, it's God-honoring. You'll get credit for it. You'll be blessed by it. So those who fall in line with his purpose that are against God, they're going to be condemned for it. See, he's going to be just in all his sayings. And so if, if you can fall in line with what God is the eternal purpose, his determinate counsel to save men by Christ, and you can, you can be, have a ministry similar to that of John the Baptist and, and, and say, follow him. Behold the Lamb of God and follow after him and you can exhort uh, sinners and admonish them to turn from their wicked ways and you can, you can edify and build up the body of Christ and labor in word and doctrine to be a benefit to the people of God. This is in accord with his determinate counsel, but see, it's for the benefit of people. It's for the blessing of people. You do that, you'll be blessed by it because you, you, you've, you've fallen in line with his determinate counsel, his predetermined plan, his eternal purpose, and now you're benevolent to him and you're becoming into the likeness of his very son who always does the will of the father. 
Well, I encourage you, brethren, to, to not only to know his will, but to walk in accord with his will and to, be, and, and, and to, to labor in accord with this determinate counsel, the foreknowledge of God, and the salvation of men.